What you've had an awful lot going on. Uh, yeah, welcome day. to Over 50, starting over, everybody. I'm Barry Edwards. And I'm Merle Garrison. And you are the very interesting Merle Garrison. That's what we were just the talking very about. very interesting. Ah, you got a lot going on. How was I your like that. Weekend? How was your last week? Oh, my week? gosh. How was your day? I want you to answer all of those questions. Re that's a lot. Boy, let me. That's I, what I, I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, no kidding. Well, hey, so last week, um, had a little vacation, which mm -hmm. was really cool. I got to uh, go to a place that Anne Marie and I have never been before. We went to Yosemite National Park. Very nice. And oh my gosh, I, you know, I've seen the Ansel Adams pictures all my life and thought, is there really a place that exists like that? <laughs> and I was shocked, Barry. I was Is shocked. That's the know, place you... that's the land of those giant sequoias. It okay, so it's in California somewhere. It is. Is it's it Yosemite? In, well, Yosemite has a whole bunch of sequoias all over the place. Like okay. I've never seen trees like this before. I've never seen sequoias before. So mm. yes, they were all over the place. I don't know if you would call it the land of the sequoias because there's like a place called Sequoia National Park. And oh. so that's sort of like the land, I guess. But huh. but it, it they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Um, but the the thing that it's really known for is all of these just mountains that are just monumental mm. edifices that have mm. sheer vertical drops. Um, wow. There's uh, like El Capitan, and then there's. Uh, Half Dome, I think those are the two most popular. And Ansel Adams, you know, he he really popularized photography, nature photography. Uh, that's really where that all got started. Mm -hmm. And man, I mean, okay, so you see it in the the pictures, mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, that's that doesn't even look real. But then when you go and you're standing there and you're looking at it, it's like, are you kidding me? The yeah. pictures don't even do justice to wow. it. It's, it first off, it makes you feel real small. But then secondly, it's like, how did this happen? I mean, it, 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 I can't even explain to you how amazing these yeah. these these places where so so there's this area called yosemite valley and so most of what you've seen with ansel adams is taken there in yosemite valley it's 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 uh several miles long and there's a river that goes through it and apparently it was carved out by a big glacier at one time and and so you've got these what look like huge mountains that were severed in the middle so like mm. they're just like rocks that go like you know seven eight thousand feet from top to bottom just straight up and down is and that beautiful. like when those what is it it's plate tectonics i think and lava would push up on the one side and make is that do you think that's what that is well what they're saying is that it was a glacier that moved through there and just uh -huh. carved a big valley uh -huh. in the in the it's like a big canyon but it, it the glacier apparently carved it and you can kind of see what they're talking about because there was one point where Anne marie and i we just we stayed in this beautiful condo up on top of the mountains by the way the driving in there, going up and down the mountains, mm -hmm. it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it sounds like the Rocky Mountains. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but so we were, that's where our condo was, was up on top of one of these mountains. Mm -hmm. And so we drive down on the first day and we get down to this beautiful river. It's just like, are you kidding? It's like paradise. And we had a lunch down there by the river and... Uh, and so the river is, it's like sandy. And so it's all this crushed granite that now is sand and that, that apparently the, the, the glacier had pulverized into sand and it was just, it was lush and it was beautiful. It was so green there and mm. just, oh my gosh, it was, it was breathtaking, literally breathtaking. I, uh -huh. There's a bunch of pictures Anne Marie took of me and my mouth was wide open. Wow, <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> well, okay, so it's a much deserved needed vacation, which yes. puts you right back at today, your first day back to work in a so, very long time. Yeah, it has been. It's been nearly 11 months since mm -hmm. I left uh, Vocera, and now was today was my first day at work as a regional sales director for Spoke. 
and it was a great day. Oh, it uh, nice. was a great day. Uh, we, we are actually doing our annual summer sales meeting. And so typically with Spoke, they get together at some place in the country and they all come in and have this big conference. And so that's what we're doing right now, except Very for cool. it's all remote. It's all, uh, oh. it's all on Zoom right now because of COVID-19. Mm. So basically I was at the conference in my, in, right here in my office all day long. And it was, I mean, you know, for a first day, it was really great because it was cool. sort of, I got pumped up, man. I, <laughs> it was really cool and everybody was excited. There's a lot of great stuff going on. Great opportunity. I took a ton of notes. Uh, I, I mean, they had a, uh, right at the very beginning of it, there was a they, they, the uh, one of the VPs was given a PowerPoint and they they welcomed me. They had my LinkedIn picture on there. Mm. I got a whole bunch of uh, uh, instant messages. Welcome to the team. And a lot of people actually did that I know work for the company that were like, mm. I have no idea. So it was oh, a wow. bit of a homecoming, actually. Ah, nice, nice. Hey, I'm just curious. When you take notes, do you do it manually the old fashioned way or do you do it I electronically? Do it. I do it the old fashioned way. Yeah. Uh, I try to do it electronically, but right. I tell you what, there's something about writing something down in my notebook that helps me to just, it solidifies things in my memory. Mm, I think so, that there's actual evidence behind that. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I don't know, it just, heck, you know, this is something I've been doing since the beginning of my career. It's mm -hmm. hard to get away from that. Mm. And um it just felt right to do it anyhow. So um, I do it all electronically. I can just, even though I've never taken a typing class, I can still type faster than I could write. I, I same here, but there's just something that, that just feels right about it. And mm. funny, interestingly, they, they had this um, sort of a uh, trivia kind of thing, a fun kind of event at the end of the day where I was imagining that the, it was like a trivia contest. I was imagining it was probably going to be about a lot of the information that was mm. covered during the day because it was mm. all day. Mm. So that was another motivation for taking notes is because I'm so uh. competitive. I'm like, I want to win this, <laughs> whatever it is. It turned out that it had nothing to do with the oh. stuff that we won. It was all just fun, like movie and trivia and stuff oh, like that. But that's cool, though. That was fun. It was you a know, fun day. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, teams and teamwork. Yes. Yeah. And I, I've had a lot of the same experience here lately. I've been working for about three different clients primarily and constantly Zooming. And I like that so much because, you know, my clients would never have given a thought to, do, to try to do that in the past. But now everyone's getting used to it and... I really feel a lot more camaraderie. I feel a lot more like I am, uh, I'm helping them, assisting them rather than doing work for them. If you know what I mean. I, I do. Yeah, it, I definitely feel a lot more camaraderie and it's, and it's fun. Uh, it's, you want to get, you know, get, hit that deadline to not let those people down. And, right, right. Um, and they're doing their thing. And uh, I just, I really like it. It's been, uh, it's, this has been more fun. I, I, this is weird to say. During this COVID period, after the first three weeks when everybody was just scared in, in place, um, but after three weeks, uh, a lot of people started to start moving again. And that's when I started getting busy with work. And, I, and this new adjustment period has been more fun than I've had in a very long time. And it's because of this feeling of teamwork, really. You know, there's nothing like it. Uh, True. And, and, you know, I mean, we've, we've both experienced growing up. We, I know you played sports. You were on teams. And it's the same kind of thing thing i mean that it doesn't go away where you don't want to let your teammates down mm -hmm. uh you know of course you want to you, you want to score the points for the team and everything but you also want to be able to to be the assist that causes the mm -hmm. score to happen as well and uh I, you know and when you win together there's i mean it's great to win but when you win as a team i'm getting goosebumps talking about this yeah. when you win as a team man it's like in the Super Bowl, you know, I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's, it's such a great feeling, you know, I, I'm looking forward to, I know I'm, oh, I'm yeah. working with a, a team again and, yeah. and um, I am very much looking forward to that, uh, 
uh, the thrill of victory. Well, and, and you're there's... also a great leader, though. You know, you're going to be leading a team in sales, and that's for you. And you're so good at it. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and I was also thinking, you know, jump in on this. I, I was thinking that, like, with this whole Zoom thing, whereas I used to always be on the phone with people and emails here and there, getting these projects done, trying to make, you know, see somebody's doing their part. And, and all this. I think that these very regular Zoom meetings are, hold us more accountable. Because you get, a, you, you read people's faces, you know? Oh, yeah. It's huge. Yep. When you send an email, you don't know what the tone is. You got to be so careful because people will take the tone wrong in a minute. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and, and it's like, Never use sarcasm in an email. That's no. going to come back and sting you because people don't get, you got to have the right facial. In fact, in business, you should probably never use sarcasm, but it's the lowest, least, lowest form got, of humor. Yeah. It, I mean, you've got to have the right, the body language means everything when it, it comes to sarcasm. So it it, probably best thing to do is stay away from it. But to your point, I mean, the, the whole, thing about being able to see people and seeing their 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 facial expressions and yeah. everything zoom i mean it really makes a difference it's it's different i think it's huge on the phone for sure i think it's huge really and it totally. you know we really can work remotely from anywhere if we embrace this technology it's just such a difference between uh well, I'll say this. I don't think there's much of a difference between doing this, you and I, just like this, or sitting literally across the table from each other. You know, it's really funny that I've heard feedback before about our, our podcast where uh, people were some, in fact, it was one of my cousins. She was surprised to find out that we weren't actually in the same room. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Like, we couldn't have been further apart and still um, be in the country. Isn't that, isn't that something? It's, it's flabbergasting. I'm just so it's kind glad. of flattering. Well, it certainly is. Um, your mic cut, got cut off on the oh. very end. Oh, okay. I hear you now. I was okay. just hoping it wasn't gone. Um, do you have any kind of uh, techniques or plan for how you want to manage your team as you ramp things up and get going a style or anything? Well, you know, in this particular role that I'm going into, I am an individual contributor. So I, I'm not actually managing a team. I'm, I'm a salesperson on a team. Uh, but I, I get to be, you know, whereas most of the roles that I've played in the past 10 years, I've been more of the coach on the sidelines mm -hmm. that, that gets to get into the game a bit. Um, now I get to be the quarterback. And, uh, you know, the quarterback is the one that calls the plays in the huddle and can call an audible. Uh, mm -hmm. This is really the role that I grew up doing. And mm -hmm. with this type of team approach that we have where I've got, uh, you know, I lead the sales effort. Um, I have a coach on the sideline uh, that I work with. And I also have teammates, like for instance, uh, a sales engineer, I'll, I'll have a clinical consultant, I'll have my implementation team, those people, I'll be coordinating that type of activity. So the first thing that I want to do is uh, take a, a humble approach first. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know everything. This is a new company. Mm -hmm. Learn as much as I can, immerse myself in the new material first off. But secondly, is that um, this is a labor of love. Um, it, you have to re remember, or I have to remember that what we are selling here really can mean the difference between life and death. And not only that, that the people that are involved in this are also on that mission so that, uh, you know, we all are in it because of, sure, we can make a lot of money doing this, but there's a compassion that goes along with this business that you have to respect as a team, mm. as a team member and leading the team. Um, and, and really understanding what's in it for them uh, as well as what's in it for me and coordinating the, the activity around that. I think that's super important to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that also uh, just having an open communication and having an environment where you can say anything when we're, when we're together as a team, if something's bothering you about how things are going, it should, we should have an open environment to be able to voice those types of concerns and, mm -hmm. and not 
impugn each other's characters by doing that. I think once you have that, uh, you know, and you keep the the prize in front of you the whole time, and that's just motivating, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if we can foster an environment like that, and I can help to foster that type of an environment, we win. I think also the other thing too is mm-hmm. that uh, this technology that we have is very exciting. It's very cutting edge. I think that it's a, a winner. Um, mm-hmm. I know my comp- my competition out there very well, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to going out into the field of battle and uh, mm. slaying some dragons. Nice, nice. How old is this company? Oh, gosh. Um, well, you see, the it's company is called... Couple times, yeah, yeah, so that's why it's hard to tell. It's, mm-hmm. it, they've been spoke for about 10 years now. Okay. Uh, but they've been a conglomeration of other companies for something like 30 years. Wow. Okay. And really the reason I asked is I was wondering how of a well-oiled machine it would be. So it, because you come in and you're a, a spoke in the wheel and um, I'm wondering, so do you have an account rep that you hand things off to that or account manager, I should say, uh, or are you, do you actually play the role of account manager? You're, yeah, I'm the account manager. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. And I'm, be curious to see uh, as things go where the common hiccups can be because there's there's a lot of different pieces a lot of different moving parts there and you're responsible for a large part of it if you are both the direct salesperson and the account manager as well but boy does it make it personal for you like uh, anything goes wrong it's it's your head on both sides you know with your company and with the company that you're serving, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I wouldn't have it on the other way. I, I, I'm cool. a person that really wants to take responsibility. And, uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if, if failure happens, I don't want it to be somebody else's fault. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to put my destiny into somebody else's hands and have them bollocks it all up. If it's going to get bollocks up, it's going to be because I did that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I learned from that. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, you know, I mean, one of the hardest things about being in management for me was that, you know, I would go into a lot of sales calls with my, with the people that worked for me as sales reps and account Mm -hmm. managers and things like that. And I would have to really allow them to take the lead and also allow them to fail Mm -hmm. right in front of me sometimes. Mm -hmm. That was probably the hardest part about what I was doing. I wanted to take the ball from it. No, no, no. Here's what he meant to say, you know, and, Uh um, you know, you can't do that and really coach somebody at the same time. They're never going to learn that way. Mm -hmm. And this is how people get better and how they develop into the type of person that they need to be, the type of professional that they need to be Mm -hmm. so that when you're not around, they're doing the best practices. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is sort of getting back into my first love and being able to, I I love being the quarterback and throwing the touchdown pass. There's almost nothing better than that. Yeah. But I, on the flip side of that, being the coach and coaching your team to a victory, there's a whole different set of pride on that as well. Yeah. There's a fatherly kind of aspect to it, you know? Uh, I, 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 it's funny you say that yeah. because even as you know the leader of the account team you know the account manager is the leader of the account team you still have that same it's just like the quarterback has sort of a fatherly kind of pride you get it on both sides mm. it, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, mm. anyhow um there is a thrill of victory, that's for sure. And there is an agony of defeat. I've experienced oh, a lot of both of them. In sales, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely ex- accentuated, uh, for sure. I wanted to tell you about, I, I did not tell you this, what a day I had yesterday. Terrible day. I, wow. I, let's see, I woke up to the news that I captured a skunk. And oh. just a quick backstory on that. Captured. Yes. Quick backstory. So at our, our, at our house that we rent out, um, our, our little family from Brooklyn is still there and uh, they just extended now through mid August. So yeah, yes, really great. And they're wonderful. They had told me that they'd been seeing this groundhog and they think that he's staying under the front porch 
And I'm like, oh no. So I'm looking it up. Well, they're very destructive. They can really harm your foundation. Oh. And uh, not to mention a rather urban uh, neighborhood like this. It's, it's not the best place for a groundhog, little kids and dogs and everything, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm an animal lover. I look up the best way to get rid of them. Get, get this cage, gets a cantaloupe as the fruit as a, uh, as bait, lead a little mm. trail into the cage and then it closes, you know, it snaps closed. And then oh. electrocutes them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, I yeah, get fried, fried groundhog from there. <laughs> I take them out to the Metro park and let them go. Well, uh, so Saturday, a beautiful day, put it up out there. And I'm like, I think we'll get them like real quick. We'll make quick work of this. And uh, so, yeah, Sunday I get the text, Barry, we caught a skunk. This is what I woke up to. Merle, I was pacing around. I'm like, I'll be over in just a little bit. I only live two miles, three miles away. I'm pacing around. What do I do? Oh my God. What do I do? How do I, how do I let him out of that what cage? Do do? Yeah. Well, I, I thought about it and I went over there. I took a blanket and I threw the blanket over the cage. Cool. So now he does, he can't see me. And then the part where the door was, I slowly, like, so I, I am way behind it, the cage. And I slowly pull that front where the door is open. And then I opened the door, was able to latch it and just back straight back, backward away. Mm -hmm. And because he's, well, I, as I hoped, he didn't run right out because he's uh, scared, right? You know? Right, right. <clears throat> but because he within, knew it was a trick. Yeah. Within 30 seconds, though, he did. It went seamlessly, thank God. Uh, so I spent the rest of the day doing errands on my bike just because I wanted to ride my bike because uh, it was a beautiful day. And right. then, okay, so about, I don't know, 7, 8 o'clock last night, my derailleur snaps off, goes up into my spokes, and I come to a screeching halt on Lee Road. I had to break Yeah, you're not going chain. anywhere. Right. I had to break my chain off in order to get the derailleur out of there so I could just walk the bike home. Uh. Well, now I can't find that derailleur. It's a 20, my bike is a 2013 um, Jameis Allegro Comp. And well, it, I, amazed me when I found out it was a 2013. It's like, wow, I still think of it as my new bike. Right. right. <laughs> Funny well, how they, that, that happens. Yes. Well, they don't make that derailleur anymore. And so I'm not sure what to do. I'm calling all these bike shops around. Like most of them aren't even going in there because they're getting paid to stay home and ride their own bike. And um, <laughs> so I can't find the derailleur. So now I'm like, you know, I go through something like this every summer and every time I do, I start going on the Craigslist and offer right. up this app and think I need a backup bike for these moments. And that's what I'm doing there now. Well, the people are buying these bikes up this year, like crazy. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's even, even Lisa told me that, that she's heard news reports about this. So I've gotten to the point now where I can't find what I'm looking for in a used route, which I would prefer to do for my backup bike. But I got to the point where I'm looking new now. I'll go with a mid, mid model, a four to five, yeah, four to $500 model. Right. They're all out of stock, buddy. What, what is the deal? COVID, what? man, COVID. People what? got nothing else to do. They're starting to ride bikes. Oh. Yeah. I guess that's kind of good. I guess that, I guess it is for everybody but me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, oh, so yeah, I've been, that really interrupted my day today too. And I just went and looked at a bike and it was just too small. You know, nobody, oh, yeah. these used bikes, nobody puts the measurement of the body frame. Right, it's the single right. most important thing that you can tell somebody is does yeah. it fit me? Have you ever noticed, it seems to me that with bicycles, it's, they're never built for big guys. No. They're, they're, they're like almost all of them are like for, li are, are, do only Primarily. little guys ride bikes? Uh, little guys are much more adept at it. It's kind of like uh, horse racing or something. Huh. It is the one sport and I have a friend that's a smaller guy and he said, this is what I love about it. He goes, I used to love playing basketball. Imagine how I was getting beat up all the time out there. Yeah. But he goes, 
uh, bicycling levels the playing field. He goes, in fact, it's in my favor. He's light, you know? Yeah. Guys like us, man, we're lugging around a lot of extra weight, you know? Well, also, you know, you go to the store and you want to get some, like, cool bike accessories or clothes. Yeah. Yeah. They never fit me. <laughs> It's just, this is what I got. A, I got like a midriff shirt, you know. <laughs> no one wants to see that. I, I'm funny. I dress exactly how I ride exactly how I normally dress. And I wear oh, I got you. sandals, flip flops, yeah. you know, shorts, t shirt. That's and I'll, right. I'll do 50 miles like that, you know. Wow. Well, I, I, I guess it should I, exactly. it's not unusual for me to do 25 miles, like 12 right, and a half right. this way, 12 and a half back. Yeah. Now I remember as a kid, I would ride with blue jeans on, but man, I can't imagine doing that today. No, me either. No, me either. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on to something else. I, I did want to tell you, I had my ribeye steak Saturday Okay. Night. Good for you. I saw yeah. you sent me a picture of that. Oh, it was the best steak I ever well, made. I had had the steak, what, the night before that? You, you told me all about it in all this detail. I couldn't get it out of my head. So Lisa got her foo-foo food at uh, the local uh, hoity-toity restaurant, which is all fine. It's delicious food. But it's, you know, it's those little portions and all that. And I want to dig into something really big and good. And uh, it turned out fantastic, but the whole time, Lisa's like, you know, you shouldn't be eating all that red meat. I don't know. You Why? just watch it. Oh, she's just a worry. Where she thinks I'm going to get heart disease because I have four steaks a year. Yeah. Oh. So I really had a hard time. Did it take the fun it. out of it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's too bad. Yes. I'm so sorry anyways. about that, Lisa. Well, let them man. have steak. Yeah. Once in a while, <laughs> we're, we're men. We need that. You do need that. I'm telling you, it chases all the bad feelings away. It really does. Hey, did you hear that it's National French Fry Day today? I think it's No, today. I didn't. I'm actually yeah. kind of glad. You know what? French fries are my weakness. I love they are delicious. Oh god, and why do they gotta be so good? You know, we another note is we got one of those air fryers uh some months oh, ago. Oh yeah, you told me about that. So, I, so have you been making made, stuff in that? Yes. Well, first of all, it makes amazing French fries. And Does so it really they're like, delicious. Like kind of crispy. Which you, yeah, all you do is like uh put just drizzle a tiny bit of olive oil on there, right? On them and mix them all up. Put the salt on there. I like pepper as well. And then yeah, man, they come out every bit as good as any restaurant for sure. Oh, they're making then, my mouth water. Here's a surprise. Last was I think it was the weekend before. Um, uh, we did fried fish, breaded fish. Well, that's what you were telling me you were about to make. Oh, Oh God, it was so good. It was, was it? really crispy. And yeah, the whole nine yards, it was so good, Merle. I can't wait to do that again. I was watching TV and it was Emerald. He was on television advertising his machine that he's got like that. And he was pulling stuff out of there. I'm like, that looks delicious. I had so many doubts. I didn't, you know, you, I, got, I had, I same here. I'm like, that can't be true. It took me forever to get my George Foreman grill, you know, <laughs> and then I finally got it, used it like three times and, you know, well, sat that's, in the that thing makes good food too. Well, it does, but uh, I, so I thought that this air fry thing, first of all, I cannot imagine what the technology is going on there. I don't know. I really don't. <laughs> it's, but it a, works, it's like the man. microwave. Yeah. yeah. I, I still, I don't know what's going on it's in there. Still, yeah. Microwave still amazes me. What, what sure. is happening? Yeah. But you know, you know speaking fry. of that, we made uh, baked potatoes. Anne-Marie made baked uh, potatoes in the oven the other day. And she uh, was like, oh, this is going to take 90 minutes. To yeah. Cook. I'm like, what? That's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do my, I do my potatoes in a microwave. You just yeah, have to here. do them, let them sit a little bit, and then put them back in again. But you hey, can listen. do them in five minutes. That's the thing. But listen, man, these oven potatoes were out of this world. It made me it consider it for like, should I? No, no. Go back to the mic. It just takes too long. Did you wrap them in foil? I I let her do it. So you oh, you wouldn't that. even know. Of course you no. don't know. Yeah. So yeah way okay. to get me in trouble again. All right. So as part of our current events we can't go through a current events period uh right now without talking about covid oh here's a big one merle this is huge i heard this on the news this morning because we always discuss well uh where's the death rate well the death rate's going down so you know 
maybe all these new COVID cases that are being reported are simply the results of all this new testing. And not to mention that if you go in for a backache and uh, die, die from something else, if they find something COVID, they'll call you COVID. Well, right. here's something that flies in the face of that. I, I had to uh, type this out as I was hearing it this morning. University hospitals two weeks ago was averaging 70 COVID patients in the ER a day. As of the last several days or whatever, 250 per day. That's uh, three times, more than three times as, as many people. Now. Mm. So, wow. and, and what I mean by this being very telling is we're talking about people going to the ER, not people that, oh, they got tested and, oh, they had, a, they had the COVID a week or two ago. Or, or something like that. So it's, it's serious stuff. It's for real. Uh, and geez, I just reading more about California, how bad it is there. Where's your audio? I ah, there, there we go. for a second. Cause I cough, cough button. Oh. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not good. I mean, the things that are happening, we've, we've really, I mean, we, for a second there, we were opening up everything mm -hmm. and everything was looking great. And now we're going backwards. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of crazy, just today, um, they, uh, they shut down my, my gym again. Oh, so, uh, the gym is done for who knows how long. I mean, this is the hard part is that it's like, you just don't know how long this is going to happen. So a couple yeah. of weeks ago, beginning of the month, they, they shut down all the, the restaurants and outdoor uh, areas here. Let's see bars, restaurants, wineries, movie theaters, mm. family entertainment venues, zoos, museums, uh, all that got shut down in most of the counties here. Fortunately, the one that I went to when I went to Yosemite wasn't shut down, but today nice. uh, the governor shut down all the rest of the counties. So um, it, that's what's happening. Um, an interesting thing that also happened was that, um, and this was kind of crazy, you know, our churches opened back up uh, a couple of months ago or at the end of May. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually within the last week, they started enforcing no singing in church. So wow. people weren't allowed to sing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's what praise and worship is. is that's mm -hmm. why you go to church is mm -hmm. sing to the Lord. It's biblical. Um, I just, you know, when, when that came out, it was sort of crazy because it feels it, oppressive, very oppressive. It's not just that it's that they are not shutting down the protests. Mm. But, well, and there's a good point too, because we said back there at that time, all these protests and riots and all that, well, there better be a huge spike in COVID in a few weeks. If, if, what you're telling us is true and bam, here it is. Well, and at the same time, then you're going to try to mitigate that by only is selectively shutting down things that seem to go against their religion, which is the church and not being able to uh, sing in church. It just seems awfully strange that that would happen. And today the governor shut down all the churches. So it doesn't matter if you can sing or not, they shut it down. But it was just a strange thing because they were saying that, um, you know, that the, the, the health minister or whatever here in the state, whatever they call themselves, they were saying that, you know, you're singing, uh, that you can spread COVID that way. And, uh, but because you're singing or shouting, but, the protesters are shouting. I mean, I've never seen people mm -hmm. shout the way that they shout at these places. And, but, but that doesn't get shut down. That's, that's the, that's the stunning part about this whole thing because it, it does feel like an attack on, on really the first amendment. And speaking of that, uh, you know, I, we may or may not have mentioned it, but uh, there was this call from the leaders, uh, a prominent leader of black lives matter that said, now it's time to start going after statues of, of Jesus. And mm. um, over the weekend, we heard about a Boston church that the uh, Virgin Mary was set on fire um, <clears throat> in Boston. And so, um, you know, you start to look at this kind of stuff. And you start, I started to wonder, how, how is this constitutional? How, how is it that the governor can shut all this stuff down? And there's nothing we can do about this. Mm. Well, 
I don't know. It's, I mean, we, we always have the same conversation and it does, it's like, well, it is a state of emergency, I suppose. I mean, we, what I, the stat that I just wrote, read off to you about the over three times as many people going to the ER for COVID here, out here. Um, I'm sure your statistics are just as bad out there. I don't know. I don't know what to, to make of all this. Uh, I saw a couple of headlines just before we got on. Um, the chief of the World Health Organization said that this, this return to an old normal, in quotes, is not in any kind of foreseeable future. Are you talking about Dr. Tedros? I think that's his name. They, they yeah. said WHO chief. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Well, you know, Dr. Tedros has a pretty crazy record. Uh, we went over that before as well. And, uh, you know, he uh, um, it was a cholera outbreak in his own country that he's on record of lying about. Yeah. And uh, he's gone on back and forth on some things as well. He's completely tied with the communist uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, I, I'm just saying this. I believe that COVID is real. I'm not trying to say that it's not. I believe that it's dangerous to... Uh, to to people, uh, I don't believe that it's dangerous to everybody. Um, I I don't believe that uh, we should all have to wear masks outside or shut down the churches. And I also find it to be extremely fishy, if it really is an emergency, that we that they're so selective in what they shut down. Mm. Um, to me, if it was really an emergency, if it really was what they're saying that it is, they wouldn't do that. I mean. It just seems odd to me how they've shut things down so selectively. And that's what's causing my suspicion meter to go skyrocket on this kind of thing is that, wait a second, this doesn't seem right. You know, for instance, we talked about this is we see these news conferences at the White House all the time where they are social distancing. And at the very same time, they're shutting down the church where you have the exact same format as you do in those same press conferences. So how is it not dangerous for them to run a press conference at the white house, but yet the same exact setup that you have, where you have somebody standing up behind a, a pole, a, a pulpit, a podium. Uh, and then you have people social distancing in the audience with masks on, uh, and they're yelling out questions or they're singing. How, I don't see the difference. I just mm -hmm. don't see the difference. So I, I just, you have to question this. Uh, I, I, I guess. Um, I don't see how you, how that, uh, you, tell, you tell me, how is it different then? Uh, I, I really don't know. Probably more distancing is my guess. What, I mean, what you mean, are you talking about in a news conference? Yeah, at the, you've seen the press conferences at okay. the White House. They're, yes. They're at least six feet apart. They're wearing right. masks. Um, right. They're yelling out questions. How right. is that different? If they do that at a church, which that's what they've been doing, how is that different? Why do you have to so, shut the church? At church, was it like six feet apart social distance with masks? Not only that, but they would limit it to 25% capacity or uh, in the larger churches, you couldn't have more than 100 people there. Yeah, well, I don't. I wouldn't see anything wrong with that myself. I mean, for I, sure, I, I don't see a difference. I think even that, better would be is if you guys could have it out outside. Uh, you know, because the uh, some of the latest reports say that it seems that COVID does, cannot live in UV light, sunlight. So, I don't know. Be great. I, I but I swear to God, every time they tell us something, it gets refuted. Um, I know. So, That's why it's so hard to it's so hard to buy into it is. because hey, of all of this. But some good news is is that there are four different vaccines that are going to trial now, and uh, they are there's even a link out there somewhere I did not make a note of it where you can sign up to be a human guinea pig if you like. But I think it's great news. We got four of these different uh, potential vaccines. Uh, the studies are being ramped up, so that's cool. I'm concerned about that myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got to be honest with you. What do you I, got I, now? All right. So when I take a look at who's behind the vaccines, I, uh -huh. I got to say that, uh, it, again, 
smells funny to me. Oh, man. Um, and I have to say that Bill Gates is behind a lot of this. And uh, he stands to profit a great deal. And it's funny about how a lot of this stuff was being developed before COVID actually got out. And how these same people were involved in those test facilities where they were testing the COVID virus that somehow mysteriously got out of these places. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, you know, I mean, taking something in, for instance, do you get a flu shot? No, I don't think I, I, I think I did once. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to take, I don't want a flu shot. You know why? Cause I don't want them to inject the flu inside of me. <laughs> and so uh, how, how is, how does this work? I, I certainly don't want to be the Guinea pig for this. Right. And by the way, in, in, you don't know what they're putting inside of you either. Sure. And so this is the thing is that it seems to me that the people that want me to have a, a vaccine are the same people that are all for um, a lot of these crazy things that are happening, like the Green New Deal. Those are the same people that mm. want me to get a vaccination. The same mm. people that want, to, want me to wear a mask outside all the time. The same people that don't want me to visit my family members. Do you know that? That's what the governor is saying? Yeah. That I should not visit my family members now? Yeah, I mean, that, right. that's, that's some crazy stuff right there. Mm. I can't visit my family and I can't go to church. Uh, I can't go to my gym. But, but I can go out and protest against civilization i mean mm -hmm. i just mm -hmm. it's, it seems to me like there's a means to an end here and it's not hard to see through all of this i my guess is about the protest stuff is that if they literally tried to shut that down of course you would have to bring in the military on that as well the look on that would be horrific um, I, I think the look on what's happening is horrific. Oh, it's, I don't think there's a good way got to go. Civilized people that aren't going to burn the town down as a result. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think that there's any good way to do most of these things that we're having to go through in a society where we're supposed to have our rights protected. But I do think that that's the thing about the protests is that if they, if they had to take the military in and shut that down, everybody would be like, Oh my God, we're in Russia now, you know? Um, uh, yeah, I think the retribution would be even way worse than what it is right now. Well, uh, I have to say, you mentioned Russia because, um, you know, that it would look like that, but it yeah. seems to look like that to me right now. Oh, a lot of things about it do. Uh, I agree. Hey, look uh, at what Bill de Blasio said the other day on CNN. He said, uh, oh, this has got to be good. What? <laughs> New York City's, uh, this is the headline, New York City's uh, de Blasio bans large events, but exempts Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, speaking on CNN Thursday night, de Blasio said the demonstrators called for social dust, demonstrators calls for social justice were too important to stop after more than a month of demonstrations have not led to an outbreak of coronavirus cases. Is that right? This is, a, this is what he said. This is an historic moment of change. We have to respect that, but also say to people that the kinds of gatherings we're used to, the parades, the fairs, we just can't have that while we're focusing on health right now. He said that to Wolf Blitzer. I mean, this, okay, okay, we can't, we can't do things that look just like the protests, but we yeah. can have the protests because it's too important. But, mm. but, but yet you had all these people die. I, I, I don't get that logic. How, how does this guy, how does this guy get to keep his job? I, can, I could never answer that. That's right up there with uh, what's her name from Seattle. Uh, uh, who, the summer of love. Yeah. Their summer of love that ends up in violence. So it, I, I don't know. I, I would love to debate you on that so we could have a good, healthy, uh, friendly fight on it but i i can't I, I can't make sense of that i can't no there's no way that you can make sense hey i got a question for you being an ohio guy mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um columbus um mm -hmm. they they pulled down a, a columbus statue you know that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. the uh the mayor of the town they're talking said, about uh, <clears throat> changing the name of the town i think is that right because they, this is what the mayor mayor ginther he announced on june 18th that the statue would be removed stating that it does not reflect the city mm. i don't get it the name of the city is columbus <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> How does it not reflect the city? <laughs> no, that's very true. That's very true. You know, I, uh, out of curiosity, started doing a little research on Columbus and all that because I hadn't learned it and cared to learn anything about it since right. I was a little kid. Yeah. And so I did pull up, uh, I, oh, you know what? I went down the rabbit hole because uh, I heard on a podcast it mentioned, um, th is the guy's name Alex, but something like Alex Ruins Everything is the name of his podcast. I think it's Alex Ruins Everything. And so I, it was mentioned that go check it out because he talks about healthcare. And so he does it in like a, about a 10 minute spoofy kind of video. I mean, there's sound effects on it. There's some animation. It's really well done. And boy, he, you know, gave a good rundown on all the different ways that healthcare is screwed up. And of course it ultimately comes back to, they have more lobbyists in Washington than any, anybody else uh, by far. They run Washington, and uh, but just uh, the way they, the amount of, uh, the way they jack up the prices on everything down to a cotton <laughs> right. swab. Um, but so I started looking at his other ones, and there was one about Christopher Columbus. I did, okay, if you start watching a whole bunch of his, you see, okay, this is very, coming from a very left-leaning uh, right, thing. Right. Uh, so the Columbus went on to talk about how, well, Columbus really wasn't a very bright guy in the first place, but the king and queen were desperate for uh, spices, I think, salt and pepper or something. I don't know. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, there was a big uh, reason for this. It wasn't just salt and pepper, but they, oh. they, it was really, spices were solving the problem of the bubonic plague. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, so Columbus thought the earth was pear shaped as a pear, you know, not perfectly round. And he thought that uh, somehow going to America, uh, or this new, new world, this new land would uh, be at the shorter, thinner end of the pear. So he could get there in like 10 days. And well, they said he never got to America at all. He was only, and I heard that originally he first landed in the Caribbean or something somewhere around there. Well, they said West that's Indies. all, pardon? It was the West Indies. Okay. They said that's all they, he did was bop around the Caribbean. He never got to America at all. Is that, what do you know about that? I would say that that's not true. Uh, here's what I know. Uh, so they had the, the, in, the, um, in the Indian Ocean, which is uh, where Indonesia is and that, that whole area, that's mm -hmm. where these uh, rare spices were found. And the mm -hmm. only way to get there was to go around the Horn of Africa. So imagine you're leaving Italy, you're going through the Mediterranean, you got to go all the way around Africa. And there were a lot of pirates there. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of, it was very dangerous. It was expensive. It took a long time. A lot of people's ships got lost. Um, there's a lot of problems with this whole thing. Even some of the islands that they would land on had cannibals on them. They'd get eaten. Yeah. Uh, so this was a terrible, uh, and they, there was a lot of war between the Spanish and the French and the English where they were just, you know, demolishing each other. So, you know, the fact is, is that uh, most people didn't believe the world was flat back then. Mm -hmm. that, that's a fallacy to begin mm -hmm. with, <clears throat> but they just didn't know the shipping lanes and how they could get there going a different way. <clears throat> that's what Columbus's theory was. He did make it to the West Indies. The reason it's called the West Indies down in the Caribbean is because of they were thought that they were in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And that, now it's called the West Indies. That's why it's mm -hmm. called that. He did make it to uh, the, the North America, uh, it's, it's very well documented, uh, the Virginia area. Uh, you've got this, you've got a lot of history going on with that whole thing. And what they're trying to convince us of is much like the 1619 movement uh, that the New York Times is trying to perpetrate on us, saying that the whole country is built off of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to do the same thing with Christopher Columbus. And it doesn't surprise me that this is coming from the leftist side of things. It, it, they're trying to rewrite our history is what's going on right here. And the fact that they're saying that Christopher Columbus was not a bright guy, 
well, how in the world was he able to do something on the seas that no one else was able to do? Can you imagine navigating all the way across the seas the way that he did and then calling him a dummy? Mm. I mean, come on. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Here's where I've been at for quite some time is I don't know what to believe anymore. Um, if they say that they have some kind of proof, okay, now – Every damn thing that I see or I read, I am always going to Google and looking up all these different things and trying to make up my own mind as to what, what is real, what is not. And then I'm at the point where I'm not really all that sure about my Google searches. Because, I would be. Yeah, exactly. They are known to slant results. Right. So it's really a difficult time. Well, um, I, I agree. And I also believe this, that when – Suddenly history changes, especially in the last 50 years, yeah. where it was one thing this whole time, and then suddenly, nope, that's not the way it happened. Yeah. That's where you got to be suspicious. Right. I mean, you know, where, where did all this come from? All of a sudden, like, we were taught growing up, they had Christopher Columbus. You got, you got Columbus Day, 1492, Columbus mm -hmm. sailed the ocean blue. Now we didn't even discover America. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did that happen? Um, and, and here's the other thing you got to look at who's writing our textbooks. How is all this mm. stuff changing and, and where is it all coming from? And then you start to look at the, the, the history of that whole thing and you start to realize these people have an agenda. Uh, they're you know trying to change things I, up. I want to get right to that because I've been in a little bit of a conundrum here. So like, uh, I don't know if you've known it or not, but Facebook has been in this kind of like an ad boycott stage where, a lot of big businesses are not purchasing their ads uh, from them because they don't like, uh, they think that there's a lot of hate speech out there, which means they want more, they want more control over free speech. And I do believe, I, I read this a little while ago, so my mind isn't fresh on it. Um, but I, I do believe they want more of the right, more of the right leaning uh, stuff uh moderated uh, and what i'm wondering is merle when we talk about these large companies that really run us that are all out there uh talking about black lives matter and this that or the other so they're always propping up how about gillette remember that ridiculous commercial they did that sjw commercial uh oh it was like shaming guys about shaving or something. How do you not know this one? It, I mean, it, it was really horrible, just really uh, pandering to the left. This is where my conundrum is. What, does, what do these gigantic companies get out of dismantling our country, bringing us into chaos and, and hoping to reorder us as a socialistic society? Because if you go on, if you go full communist, the government is going to be running primarily owning your company. So how is that, how is it this anti-capitalist thing in their best interest? Well, if you notice in capital in, in socialist countries, you'll see that you pretty much only have a choice of one or two different brands of products. So that means that whoever, whatever company that is has a complete monopoly. And so what, what their advantage is this is that they can, they're working to have a complete monopoly so that you don't have a choice. Once you have a complete monopoly, you don't have to do research and development anymore. You don't have to pay your people anymore. You don't, I mean, you don't have to pay them a fair wage. You can pay them whatever the heck you want to pay. Yeah. Uh, there is a ton of advantage for these large companies to have their way in a socialist type of society where whatever they say goes, because guess what? They're the ones that basically run the government. That's how it works. They're in charge. Mm. Uh, that, that does make pretty good sense because they are, they are running the government. Uh, right. Well, in more and more, that's what you're seeing because over our lifetime and before our lifetime, you're seeing that we've become more and more of a socialist society. Oh, sure we have. Yeah, for sure. But I think that's inevitable too. I, you know, I really do believe that we have the, what do I want to say? The wealth that literally there's enough wealth and i don't i don't mean this in a straight up socialist way because it's going to sound very much like it but i can also tell you why the the social why marxism is so attractive because i do believe that there's enough wealth in this world 
that nobody has to starve, that everybody can be just fine, but there is such a hoarding of it and always such a power struggle uh, amongst all of us that we always are, we're still in uh, all of these pockets of poverty. So, hmm. yeah, I, I, so, I thought I had a question for you there, but I forgot yeah. what the question was. Well, that's okay. I mean, I, I believe that, uh, like you, I believe that there's enough wealth in the world. I don't believe that there has to be poverty, but I, don't, I believe that socialism does exactly what you just said was the problem, which is the hoarding part. Mm -hmm. Because in every Agreed. socialist society, that's what the downfall of the society has been. Oh, and very quickly. Very I don't quickly. think that we've found a perfect economic uh, vehicle here, and we probably never will. But I do believe that capitalist societies, based on 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 competition, uh, is probably our safest way to go. And sure. I don't believe that hoarding money is actually what the problem is out there. Uh, I, I just I, I I don't see it that way. I think there's enough money to go around, but I also believe that um, that that in people that have a lot of ingenuity and a lot of um, thinking outside the box can find ways in a capitalist society to enrich the poor. And it's Absolutely. not by giving them a fish. It's by teaching them how to fish. Agree. No, agree completely. Every, we need purpose when you say, I, and I agree with you, I don't think that the world has seen its best form of government yet, but we sure could learn a lot from what we did a good lot of good things from what we did. Now, where, where things have gone awry, the founding fathers could never even fathom. Imagine a company as big as General Motors or Google. They couldn't imagine that back then. So there was not a way to protect us really from, I guess, that this kind of level of power that has come in the corporate world. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I could debate you on that. I, I get the, the, the main point that you're trying to make, but there were certainly mega corporations uh, at the time of the founding fathers. And, and you mentioned uh, Christopher Columbus. These corporations actually started with the shipping industry to begin with. And they, they were battling it out at the very same time. In fact, the founding fathers were many times victims to this whole kind of corporate uh, takeover. The Boston Tea Party had a lot to do with that so uh, you know this is they they here it didn't really go wrong with the corporations what i see happening is it went wrong when they started to fiddle around with the original purpose of the constitution and you started to get lifetime politicians that yeah. were in there and then that that and then they started to and then the court system started to uh, get outside of their area of expertise or their, their, their uh, branch of government, and they started legislating from the bench. This is when things started to become corrupt. This is how, uh, that, and, and not, not to mention the bureaucratic state where you've got unlimited spending with no accountability. And their, their, whole, their whole purpose is to, um, is, is to get government contracts and to spend as much money as they can in their budget because they won't get that budget money again mm. allocated to them if they don't spend all of it. You see, these are things that weren't inside of our constitution. There were, these were never supposed to be things that were done in our country. And as a result, you've got the tail wagging the dog. I really do think that the founding fathers were thinking about that, but I do also believe that people that had that wanted to have that absolute power, as we talk about before, that absolute power corrupts absolutely. These are the people that have been able to infiltrate our system and, and change our system. We've had amendments to our constitution that, that the Americans were tricked into in, in order to change the balance of powers here and forever change the United States. Now we can change it back again, and we've talked a little bit about that. Article 5 of the Constitution gives us a lot of power to change those things back. But we've got to educate people on how to make that happen. Mm, yeah, that's definitely a problem with our system is people are not 
educated well enough and really don't even have the incentive. I, I was going to get back to, I was coming full circle talking about uh, certainly a problem with socialism is that people lack purpose. All right. When, when you give people the fish rather than teaching them the fish, uh, it just they do not wake up in the morning with purpose. And what often you fill that with a couple of things for one drugs and <clears throat> pardon me. And then another, you're just always going to go, uh, men will go looking to create chaos and it, look for adventure is that is what we're geared for. And so, uh, I think that's kind of largely where we're at right now too, is we got a Big time. Whole, whole lot of men just want the chaos and adventure and uh, bring it down because it sure beats going out and getting a job. You know, I'm not sure if I said this before, but just talk about what a great example this is of people not wanting to work today is uh, the trades industry, which m most of my family is in. They cannot get college kids uh, on summer vacation to work for them anymore. They'll do it for one day. And it's like, no, that's too hard. You could do almost anybody could go and start up uh, a trade like a plumber, electrician or something like that, making six figures, making a hundred grand a year. And yet they, they, we can't get people, the younger people to do it today. Hmm. So. Well, yeah. they've been coddled. That's for sure. I yeah, mean, I know. We've talked about that. Quite I know. A bit. I don't want to beat that dead horse again. <laughs> but You know, I wanted to ask you, so back to the Facebook with the ad embargo because yeah. of the debate over censoring so-called hate speech. What do you do with that? Now, let's say, I, I would assume that you're going to say, well, there should be absolutely no ban on any speech. Well, at what point where, uh, I don't know. What if there's a KKK group type group out there uh, wanting to uh, uh, incite violence, killing, stuff like that? Do you do something about that? Well, I don't want to say, yeah, go ahead and write about killing people. I, I you know, I just think that um, I, this, is, this is a tough one, Barry. Um, it is. That's why I brought it up. I, yeah. I, I don't know the answers. It's kind of like, let's put it in more traditional terms. If the KKK held a rally and said all that stuff public, publicly, that's, that's within the legal right, is it not? It is. Okay. I mean, you're, you're seeing rallies today where they're saying, um, you know, kill the cops. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing that. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. So I guess it should be quite, a, what I'm wondering is, and I do mean I'm wondering, I haven't thought this through. Um, there's a lot to think about. If it were completely opened up, okay, social media, uh, just all of a sudden everybody got on the bandwagon, stop with your wanting to control free speech. All speech is necessary, no matter how radical it is, because we need to find the nut jobs on the right and the left so we can find the truth, which is always somewhere more towards the middle. Okay, would that, would that actually help cure this polarization, this polarized time that we're in, people picking sides on everything, or would it, would it intensify it? Personally, I believe this, that um, I believe that there's a reason why the First Amendment says that there's freedom of speech and that and it has everything to do with not so much the, the people that are out to do bad things, but the fact is with freedom of speech, you can say all the good things and people can tell the difference between good and bad as long as they understand what the good is. Um, it's sort of like... Uh, I found out uh, that uh, people that uh, that are specialists in counterfeit money, spotting counterfeit money, rather than studying counterfeit money, they study the actual money because mm -hmm. studying the actual money is how they can spot a counterfeit. Um, and so I really believe in this, that there should be free speech, that there really shouldn't be a lot of limits to, to free speech. I, I think that there's, there's reason, for instance, there's, you know, you're, you're not allowed to yell fire in a, in a crowded theater, right? That's against the law because it, sure. it becomes dangerous. You, you'll have sure. a, a stampede happen. So I, I believe that there are some limits to that. 
but where you draw the line on that whole thing is, is really the difficult part because once you start to draw the line, then that line gets blurred pretty easily. And I think we've always struggled with that. There's no real easy answer to this one, right. but I, I would, I, I would be more of an advocate towards allowing the KKK to say their piece um, I, I, I think that when you start talking about killing people, that should be where you're drawing the line. Mm. Uh, but, you know, they, they have hatred and they should be allowed to voice their hatred. Mm. Um, just, be, and just like you I have what? love and I should be able to voice my opinion about love. I mean, just like we talked about how the church is being shut down. I, I like what you of love. I like what you're saying, because even if you let a radical group spout their hate, you know, the nice thing about it is, you know, where they are. Exactly. You That's know, exactly it's it, right. It's not some taboo running like a underwater river, you know, but about the bubble oil. No, I, I kind of, I'm kind of right there with you. I think uh, I, I, I'm right there with you too. I'd rather uh, know that this is a group that they hate this, this person or that person mm -hmm. or this kind of person or that thing yeah. uh, and, and have the truth out there. And here's the other thing that I know is that the truth has a ring to it. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I think that everybody inside of their heart of hearts can hear the truth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that our country is built on a foundation that agrees with that, that, that we're not afraid of the lies because the truth has a ring. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we put the truth up to a lie, that we can see the difference. And I, um, I, I, I think that that's what makes our country different from all the other countries that are out there. But I do see where they're trying to shut that down. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I vehemently disagree with that. Like for instance, the whole terminology of hate speech, I think that's been abused. I, I agree. I, I think the, the same, another term that's been abused is um, systemic racism. Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I just think that, the, what does that mean? Almost what, anything now. It, it, yeah. Exactly. And so just just calling you, someone a racist. You, yeah, these for are dangerous. anything. Yeah. But I, I also believe that you can, that it should be legal for us to call out people that are saying that without being canceled in this cancel culture sure, of ours sure. I think that's i think that's again um really squashing freedom of speech yeah. and i think that if you can't show the right then the wrong starts to seem right agreed uh we're gonna have to start wrapping this up a bit just want to talk about some things on a lighter note a sillier note have you heard about will and jada smith no, what's uh, what's going on with them? Get out of here! You haven't. It's been well, I've been kind of. Oh, you say, were I went gone. on vacation, and I didn't have any internet. I had no cellular. Yeah. I had no news. It was fantastic. Oh, you're right. That is. That is. Um, so some rapper, young guy, like 27 years old, comes out and sa and says that he's in love with Jada Smith, and has had a had an affair with her, and he's like heartbroken. <coughs> Pardon me. And so this goes all through the tabloids, like, oh my God. And it's, all, it's always been speculated that they have this open relationship. Anyway. Really? Mm, open marriage. Wow. And it's, uh, it's just been kind of said, uh, whispered a bit, you know? Huh. Well, huh. she just came out like a day or two later, which is about a day or two ago, and admitted, yes, she did have this affair with this guy. Kidding. He even went on vacation with the family to Hawaii. He said he had Will Smith's blessing what? for the affair. Yeah. You're kidding me. That's yes. Oh, my God. So this is where they're at right now. It's all this big, swirly mess. Oh. Uh, and so I like to read the comments section on things like right, that. Right. And it's half the people are like, it's none of your business what they do. And then I don't know. It's and other half are picking sides, trying to find sides to pick on this stuff. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that, is that something? <laughs> hey, though, um, on a sadder note, uh, how about that, that girl from Glee? Yeah, that you know that happened. That's pretty close to here. Uh, yeah, where that happened, yeah. and uh, oh, it's just, just so sad. You know, they they found her, her today. 
Yeah, I saw that, but they found the the son sleeping in the boat, right. like so, like only vaguely aware of what really is going on. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's just a tragedy. It's, that it's is awful. a tragedy. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine uh, what exactly happened to her. You know? No, well, I you know it's it's a it's a dam, and these dams they're they're you know where the lake is. It's all uh-huh. dammed up, and they're they're super deep. I mean, it's, it's like it's like 130 feet deep. Mm-hmm. It's so you know the dam. The way it works is water sucking down through the dam and everything. Uh-huh. So she may have gotten caught in some kind of a current and oh. sucked her down in there, and and, and maybe and that's why it took so long. Life. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, oh. I, but just a, a terrible tragedy terrible it truly is truly is um what do you got there and uh, i was gonna say that uh, yeah i watched uh, over the weekend i watched that movie uh the the invasion of the body snatchers and, the original uh, he, no donald? not the original it was the one with donald sutherland oh well, i thought I, that was the original both. I thought that. Oh was no, good. the original was actually a black and white. Because they've also uh, got a more modern one. Oh, do they well, really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Well, I, I I highly recommend it if you want. I to see saw it, it at the theater. Movie. Yeah, back you when did. it came out. Oh, it it it, it was creepy. It so was I got to tell you this. This is what's funny. Is don't that fall I, asleep. I I read this review from this guy who said that he watched it at the midnight movie and he uh, wasn't expecting it to be scary. He thought it was going to be dumb. Uh-huh. And uh, and what the thing about it he said was that um, it was a midnight movie. So he he was he was tired. And oh, yeah. uh, he started to kind of fall asleep oh. during, during the movie. And it was really scary. It was sort of like that Freddy Krueger. Yeah, yeah. It was really scary to him. And he said that at the end of the movie, you know, where Donald Sutherland does that yeah. thing, you know, with his eyes and that horrible noise. He said yeah. it was like a cold bucket of water hit him. And it just <laughs> really messed him up. And uh, he, uh, he said there's a couple of guys behind him that were saying, oh, this is the dumbest movie ever at the when the lights came up and everybody he was sure that these guys are saying it because it really did scare him. Right, right. So, uh, he, went to, uh, he went to tell his dad about this because he knew his dad had seen the movie and he, he said um, that uh, he, was, he was relating to his dad how scary it was at the end. And just then his dad perfectly imitated Donald Sutherland pointing with the thing. <laughs> and it was scared the crap out of the guy don't do that <laughs> just like, i would just i could just see my dad doing something like sure. that to me it just sure. your dad doing that to you can really mess you up for an entire generation <laughs> i was just gonna say my dad was great at scaring the crap out of me like he would go to great lengths to do this so so i just wanted to finish with this so sure. one day my dad had this thing about the fireplace and um he would always make either my brother or me sleep on the couch next to the fireplace if there was a fire in the fireplace at some point during the evening. Uh, I mean, the fire might, might have been out for hours, but he was concerned that an ember would pop out of there and burn the house down. Sure. And so one of us had to sleep down there. I always wondered, like, what, you want me to burn up? Like, <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? He said that I would scream, it would wake him and my mother up, and they would be able to escape. <laughs> yeah, but what about me? <laughs> well, my, my brother had gotten, he had, he had gotten this terrifying werewolf rubber mask from the haunted house. It fit all the way over your head. It was like his skin tone. He could just put that on right in front of me and it would be startling to me. He'd start wow. moving his head around like that. <laughs> My dad, you know, he was like an executive at Ohio Bell. Yeah. So get this. So one night I, I go to sleep on the couch and I wake up the next morning to the, I thought I heard this like that, you know, like, you know how you kind of fade back in. And yeah. I was like, what was that? And I kind of, there was a blurry mass in front of me. And then I heard it again, but much louder this time. Ha! And there was this werewolf with his arms up in the air. You remember how big my dad was. Yeah, yeah. He was wearing that werewolf mask. <laughs> <laughs> I think I ran in place, tore up the couch. <laughs> I couldn't believe he was wearing that thing. It didn't dawn on me that it was him until about 10 seconds. After. <laughs> that had to be the best laugh for him oh, ever. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we got to. Still reeling from that. We got to wind this up. We're an uh, hour and 15 in, I think. Um, anyways, yeah. guys, please go to over50startingover.com and check out all of our stuff. 
sign up for your favorite uh, podcast and or come to our YouTube channel. Give us a like. Give us a comment. We really appreciate it. And Merle, talk to you next week, buddy. Yeah, Barry. Already.